Okay, hi, uh, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the William H. Newcomb Institute of Computational Science here at Dartmouth College. And on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to this year's fall Donahoe Colloquium, 3D Printing, Making the Future, delivered by Professor Jennifer Lewis of Harvard University. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64, and a former trustee. The world of material design has historically been an important nexus of science, art, and engineering. It provides a focusing context that spurs innovation and creativity in a wide range of disciplines. In today's digital world, we must certainly join the word computation to the list of important players in this arena. There are algorithms that go into designing elements wholly on the computer, the extraordinary digitally rendered yet malleable visualizations that it enables, and even the computer simulations that allow us to study the physical challenges that the objects will endure once we produce them and send them out into the real world. But computation also guides and in many cases completely controls the process of production. The hands-free transformation of information into object is 3D printing. The ease with which this is now done and the range of materials that can be used and objects that can be produced is revolutionizing education, the arts, and a wide range of industries and professions, perhaps none as dramatically as medicine. With the level of detail afforded by computation and precision instrumentation, as well as a growing catalog of biocompatible materials, 3D printing is causing us to rethink how we approach many different kinds of medical challenges. We print models to practice procedures and objects to replace our failing or failed parts. To quote from a 2014 New Yorker article on the subject, increasingly what we are printing is ourselves. We can even print at the level of a microvascular network, networks whose pipes have diameters on the order of 100 microns or so. This is among the pioneering achievements of this evening's speaker, Professor Jennifer Lewis, who is one of the leading innovators in our brave new world of bioengineering. Dr. Lewis received her PhD from MIT in ceramics engineering and after a long and incredibly productive stay at the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois has been at Harvard since 2013, where she is now the Hans-Jörg Vice Professor of Biologically Inspired Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. To date, her research has resulted in about 30 patents and 150 papers. She is also a co-founder of two companies which are commercializing technology from her lab around new fabrication technologies for circuitry design. Dr. Lewis's research has, re has received an extraordinary range of recognition. She's not only been recognized by the White House as a presidential faculty fellow, but has also received the Langmuir Lecture Award from the American Chemical Society and the Materials Research Society Medal. Dr. Lewis is a, is a fellow of the American Ceramic Society, the American Physical Society, the Materials Research Society, and the, Academy, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In the New Yorker article that I mentioned, Dr. Lewis was quoted as saying about her work that she, quote, fell in love with the idea of creating matter that matters, end quote. I love that. Um, we look forward to her sharing her enthusiasms and ideas with us this evening, so please join me in welcoming our 2015 Donahoe Colloquium lecturer, Jennifer Lewis. Dan for that very kind introduction um, and I want to thank the Newcomb Institute for the invitation to present today and I've had a wonderful day here at Dartmouth 
um, spending time with faculty and students from both the medical school and the Thayer School of Engineering. So it's been truly a wonderful day, and I hope that uh, I can give back tonight by sharing some of the things that we're doing in my lab here at Harvard. Um, and if we look at the, at the slide, I mean, this is really an outline for the presentation. I'm going to start uh, focusing on some work that we're doing on printing electronics, then I'm going to move to little micro batteries, um, some embedded sensors, and then ultimately I'll end with some of our latest work that we started at Harvard on printing tissues, and specifically vascularized tissues. Uh, so let's start with just a broad overview of 3D printing. I think Dan gave a wonderful introduction. And I think, you know, if, if you've listened to NPR, or read the New York Times, or The Economist in the last several years, the few years, I should say, you've, you've come into contact with the term 3D printing. I'd love to know how many people have actually used a 3D printer. Anybody here in the audience? Right, so, so you know, it's becoming a pretty ubiquitous technology. Um, and at the same time, there's also a lot of hype associated with this technology. And I mean, if you, if you, uh, re, you know, believe everything you uh, see on Google, you could convince yourself that people are already 3D printing whole organs, and that's simply not true. So I want to kind of give you a sense of what I feel is where the field is now, where it's going and maybe some of the excitement that we have about the potential and opportunities. So let's start with like why this is becoming such a, a mainstream platform and why people are excited. Well, first of all, as Dan said, this really does allow you to take a digital file and directly port it into a printed object. So the, the gateway to transformation is really this three-dimensional printer and the materials that it's patterning uh, in real time. And the important thing about it is it allows you to go from this design, this CAD, this computer-aided file, to the part within less than 24 hours, and oftentimes within less than a few hours. So if you're a designer or an engineer in a company, imagine how quickly you can innovate, test your ideas, print the parts, look at them, and innovate again. Right? So this is really driving the process. You no longer need masks or expensive molds or tooling in order to make these objects. You can just print them. Right? So that's a real driver. Now, if you look at today's platform, the today's technology, what you can go out and buy commercially, there's really three primary advantages that I, that I see in what existing commercial printers can allow. One is the idea that you can really create highly complex parts. So GE has adopted this technology to make this metal fuel injector. Normally, using conventional manufacturing processes that require molds and dyes and masks, it would take 18 individual components to make this part. Now they can 3D print it in one shot. It has a complex internal architecture. And so you can see the power of, 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 of using that kind of technology. This is a component up here at the top. It's a micro lattice. It's a 1,000 times less dense than water. Okay, And the way this is made is by printing a polymer scaffold and then electro-depositing metal and then burning out the polymer. And you can see it sitting here on this dandelion, right? And so um, this is a component that you could not make by any other process. It couldn't simply be made any other way. And then mass customization, I think, is a real driver for this technology because you can design to a specific body part, right? So this is an Invisalign shield for orthodontics. Many of you may actually wear them. Um, they make about 80,000 a day. This is a hearing aid shell that's molded by 3D printing. About 98% of the in-the-ear hearing aids are made this way. But then they still have to hand pot the electronics. So that's a labor-intensive process. It takes a couple of days. So the idea is, wonder if you could go beyond form. I wonder if you could take 3D printing beyond form and add embedded function. So these are some of the things that we're trying to do. So like just to set the stage, if we think about you know, starting with an idea, OK, this girl wants to make a cool jet fighter plane. Um, she designs this in a CAD file. Um, and then from there, we have a, a file that's a three-dimensional part. And then in order to print this, for those of you who have never used a 3D printer before, what's done in, 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 in the computer is that file, that three-dimensional part, is sliced into individual layers. And then layer by layer, that component is printed. And this is just an example of a re in real time of a part being printed. And you can see that this is a nozzle here depositing ink, and it's just layer by layer patterning this component. OK, so 
this technology has been around for three decades. Even though it's really burst onto the scene in the last, say, five years, it's really been developed over the course of three decades. And if we look at the types of printers that you can go out and, and buy today, if you wanted to put one in your house, you could get a, a low-level fused deposition modeling uh, printer from MakerBot. There is a, another company down in the Boston area called Form Labs that's uh, commercialized the stereolithography approach, where you use light to locally cure or polymerize a liquid resin that's housed in the printer. Or you can use something like a higher power laser beam to locally weld powders together on a powder bed. Um, the cost of these printers can be as low as a few hundred dollars now, up to a million plus, depending on the complexity, the build volumes, and, and, and the types of printing tools that are used. And then you know, the interesting thing about this is, although this platform has been around for 30 years, there's still really three different classes of materials that have been developed and are available commercially. There's thermoplastic filament, which is used in the fused deposition modeling approach. There's these UV curable resins. And then there's powders. And those powders could be uh, polymer-based or metallic-based, depending on the component. But you know, in order to really unleash this process, okay, in order to go beyond just making shapes and making complex prototypes, we felt that you know, what's really needed is to bring new materials to, to this platform so that one can embed things like electronics, one can build batteries, and ultimately um, even create things like living tissue. So that's really what my lab has been focused on over the last decade or so, starting with electronics and then ultimately very recently moving to living tissues. So what does that require? Well, for one thing, it requires a brand new type of printing platform. And we designed and built this one here in collaboration with a company. Um, it has four individually addressable print heads, and that allows us to bring down multiple types of materials as we're building, as you can see in real time, this scaffold being built here. So for example, if you're building a micro battery, you might want to co-deposit an anode and a cathode, as I'll describe later. Or if you're building a tissue, you might have a cell-laden ink A, a cell-laden ink B, a fugitive ink that, just, that defines the vasculature, and then another ink that sort of caps it off as the extracellular matrix. So being able to have something that has multi-material capabilities is important. And the other thing about this flexible stage is it, everything is done at room temperature. Okay, so, and as you can see, we often don't need a, a support material, which is one of the things that most 3D printing platforms require. So why is that? Why don't we need a, a support material? Well, we designed these inks to be viscoelastic, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But in addition to these individually addressable print heads, we also have a number of different print heads that we've designed that allow us to mix materials on the fly, that allow us to, instead of having just one material coming out, that allow us to have multiple materials in a single filament as we're printing, or to have many filaments coming out at once so that we can increase the throughput of printing by instead of printing one line at a time, printing many lines at a time, or even two different types of materials arrayed as we're printing. So this is the secret sauce. If you take nothing more out of the talk, take this away. For our printing platform, we use a material, as I said, that's viscoelastic. So what does that allow it to do? It allows it to come out of the nozzle and maintain a filamentary shape. And it even allows it to come out of, out of the, out of the you know, sort of away from the surface in free space in, across a, a, an unsupported region, or an air gap in this case. What you're looking at is an ink here that's being deposited through a 30 micron nozzle. Now, the diameter of like a single strand of your hair is about 100 microns, so this is a third uh, times less than that. And it also it contains about 50 or 60 percent by volume of water. Okay, so it should be a fluid, right? But it has these particles, and we engineer this viscoelastic response. I guarantee every one of you today had an, an encounter with the viscoelastic material. Of course, at least I hope you did, because I hope every single one of you brushed your teeth this morning, OK? So if you did, when you applied pressure to the toothpaste tube and you squeezed out that toothpaste onto your brush, that's essentially what we're doing here. We're applying a pressure to this concentrated ink. It's flowing when we apply pressure. But when we let the pressure go, after the material has exited the nozzle, it recovers very quickly a solid-like response so that your toothpaste doesn't flow off your brush. That's, you know, in essence, what we're doing right here. 
So this is the actual science behind that. So if we describe a viscoelastic material, what we say is that it shear thins. That means the harder we squeeze, the easier it flows. And we also say that as it comes back to a zero shear stress condition, when we take away that pressure, when the ink comes out of the nozzle, it has a solid-like response. And that allows it to maintain its filamentary form even as we cross gaps in the underlying layers or come out of plane. And that's, and that's the whole thing that we do. So every ink that I described today, we've engineered to have that same kind of rheology. But in addition to that, we have to build in the function. So if it's a conductive ink, it has to conduct electricity. And so we'll go through some of these examples. Um, I'll describe some work that we've done in 3D antennas using conductive inks. I'll describe some of our work on batteries. And I'll highlight a little bit of our work on sensors which is the functional materials that we've developed for 3D printing. And then at the end of the talk, I'll introduce some of our work on printing living tissue. So I won't go into all of the details about how we make these inks, but we start with a precursor. These inks that I described that I showed you know, printing out of plane consist of little tiny nanoparticles of silver. Each of these are about 20 nanometers in diameter. We, we concentrate them to create something that's highly concentrated so that as it comes out of the, out of the um, nozzle, as I said, it has that viscoelastic response. So this is the regime where we want to be for that, for that uh, re rheological behavior. So as we concentrate, as we build ever more concentration of nanoparticles, we go from something that has a viscosity that's about 10 times that of water to many, many orders of magnitude higher. If we go even higher in concentration, we clog the nozzle, right? So printing stops. So that's no good. But importantly, in addition to the rheological behavior, we want these particles to form a network as printed that's conductive. And you can see even at room temperature when we print this material, it has a high uh, conductivity, which um, is given by here. And the actual conductivity is silver. Bulk silver is about 200 magnitude lower. So it's about on the order of 10% uh, or 1% of bulk silver. Now, as we go to higher temperatures, of course, we can make the conductivity even higher. But even as printed, it can carry electricity, can carry current. And this is a, um, a, a product, a, a pen that we developed in our lab called uh, a, a circuit scribe. It's a, a, I think you saw that the minute this circuit was, was completed by, tra by drawing this trace across there, um, we were able to light up those LEDs. So that shows you immediately upon printing, we can carry a current. And then we can do this, and we can integrate with um, surface-mounted LEDs to create little displays. We can even create a programmable displays by coupling this with something like, like, like an Arduino, programmable Arduino, right? So this is printing at its simplest form, right? You can go out and buy a pen for a few dollars, fill it with, these, with this nanoparticle ink, and create circuits on the fly. Now, of course, we can also use this to create something a bit more sophisticated, like these three-dimensional antennas. And here is just an example of us printing the silver ink through nozzles of sizes as small as a micron. Now, this is 100 times less than the diameter of a single strand of hair. And you can see that we can build this up layer by layer as we go. And importantly, as we print these um, features, because we're using such a concentrated ink, these features are essentially high aspect ratio. They have a height that's almost as tall as the um, diameter of the nozzle that's being printed. So as we build this up layer by layer, we can create some very nice high aspect ratio structures which will be important for the battery examples that I'll describe in a minute. So one of the first things we did with this conductive ink was to create a three-dimensional antenna, called a, specifically called an electrically small antenna. And here, the size of the antenna is about an order of magnitude less than the a characteristic wavelength that it's trying to receive. And that's important. And now many of the cell phones that are being uh, commercially made have these three-dimensional antennas embedded within them. Not in this exact form factor, but this design space is really opening up, making the devices more compact, of course, as we try to cram ever more into these cell phones. So the way we do this is we take our ink and we simply create these meander line traces, which are the conductive traces that coat the outer part of this hemisphere. We can coat the outer part. We can coat the inner side. And of course, if we do the inside of this, shown here, we actually make a, an antenna that's more robust, because now we've, we've actually embedded the conductor inside so that when we flip it and mount it onto the back plane, 
we have a very um, protected uh, conductive feature. And if you see here, um, for those of you who don't know antennas, probably many of you are like me that are not antenna experts, we actually collaborated with Jennifer Bernhardt's group at, at Illinois to do this work. But this voltage standing wave ratio is a measure of antenna performance. And as long as it's below a, a, a value of two, it's a, it's a decent antenna, and the closer it is to one, the better. So you can see that the antenna performance here is, is very, very good. And it's equivalent almost to what you would expect from the simulations that were used to guide the, the design of this antenna. So we can print these types of conductors. Now another thing that we started at Illinois just before I moved to Harvard was some work with another colleague there, Shen Dillon. And here the idea was to create micro batteries. So we'll, we'll come back to this, but first let's look at one of the drivers. So this is some work out of, out of a, a colleague of mine at, at Berkeley, Chris Fister's group. And you can see that he's making these little autonomous sensors. He, he likes to refer to these as smart dust. Well, they're not going to fly if they're tethered to a battery that like weighs more and is more vo by volume than, than the actual sensor itself, right? So if we look at what kind of batteries are available commercially, um, and we think about the kind of battery that might be useful in terms of a form factor, this is about a millimeter by a millimeter, then um, we need a new technology, right? So we need to figure out how, how we can do that. So we decided that we would try to focus on printing these kinds of micro batteries at very, very fine scales. So we're, now we're about uh, a thousand times lower in volume than the commercial batteries that are available. Um, just to step back for those of you who really haven't thought about how batteries work before, um, these rechargeable batteries, which are now ubiquitous, all of our electronics have them, and even Tesla, you know, a, the electronic car company, is based on, on having uh, battery packs that are based on lithium-ion batteries. And so what happens in these rechargeable batteries is as you're, as you're using them, we've got uh, lithium uh, ions going in one direction and electrons being extracted. And when you recharge them, you run the reaction in reverse. So that's a cycling. One cycle is a charge-discharge. And we, we want to keep these electrodes, these two electrodes, the anode and cathode, very close together because it's really a diffusion-limited process. So because um, this is actually moving through a liquid electrolyte, typically. So a colleague um, at uh, the Naval Research Academy wrote a very nice paper um, several years ago that gave a way to some, some very interesting architecture designs that could be done if there was a process by which one could pattern in three dimensions. And so we took this simple design, this interdigitated plate architecture, as our, as our inspiration for creating or printing our micro batteries. And so you can imagine we have an anode interdigitated with a cathode filled with a liquid electrolyte. So we developed these inks, again, a cathode and anode ink. They have that same kind of rheology that I described before, shear thinning response, a viscoelastic solid-like response at low shear stress. And then we printed these. And the motif that we use, as I said, is this interdigitated design. So first we evaporated down gold in, uh, contacts. And then we printed the um, anode. In this case, it was a lithium titanate oxide, LTO. And then we interdigitated or interwove in that um, a lithium iron phosphate, which is the, cation, uh, the cathode. And then we capped it uh, to create a packaged battery. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So this is actually the battery being printed. And you can see that we can create these very high aspect ratio structures. And now we're coming over and printing another anode. And then ultimately, we have to come back in and fill in with the cathode, right? So if we look down at the top view of one of these walls, it's about 30 microns in width. And then each one of these layers, as it's printed, increases the height of the battery. Now, that's important, because in a micro battery, you typically want to control the, the area that it takes up, right? Microelectronics, you're always worried about the area that things are taking up. But if we think about this, if we come out of plane, we can, we can add, in the given area, we can pack more energy into that device because we're putting more lithium ion material into a volume uh, that occupies the same overall um, area. So this is what it looks like in an array that we've printed. And each one of these, as I said, is about a millimeter on a side and a height of about a half a millimeter, so 500 microns. And then we can come back in and we can interdigitate the cathode. 
And ultimately, if we look at the performance of this battery as a function of cycle numbers, we see that upon charge and discharge, that the battery has pretty stable performance, right? So we're able to make batteries that are essentially as small as a, as a grain of sand. Now, the bad news in Gen 1 was that we had to package this thing in a very kludgy manner. So here's our little battery sitting here. And then we have this plexiglass um, casing that we put over the battery. And then, of course, it goes on and on. Um, so it allowed us to do some interesting science, but it wasn't really practically so important. Um, since being at Harvard, we've kind of moved to a, a, a hybrid approach where we're printing the anode and cathode, but we're packaging it using uh, laser machining to create these arbitrary designs shown here. So this is kind of work in progress, but you can get the idea that it's really a powerful way to make customized batteries of arbitrary shapes or form factors. So another thing that we started at Harvard was um, this idea of embedding sensors and printing sensors inside elastomeric materials. This is actually all of this work that I'm showing here is from Rob Wood's group, um, where he was taking elastomers and filling them in with uh, and a conductive metal, which is liquid at room temperature, called E-gain, which is a, a, a eutectic uh, gallium indium material. In order to make these, and you can see that he's made strain sensors and, and uh, pressure and strain sensors together, there was a complex process. So it started with creating multiple molds. So going back to this idea of tr traditional manufacturing, you need molds. So he had to make multiple molds for each layer create these channels that would pervade through the structure, and then ultimately after an eight or nine step process, inject in the metal and then laminate it all together and create this device. Now think about you're stretching this and you're pushing on it. So delamination between these individual layers was a big point of failure. But wonder if we could just print the entire thing or print it in a matrix so that we don't have delamination. And that led us to develop a new type of printing process that we refer to as embedded 3D printing, where we come down with our nozzle and we come down into a matrix and we print. And in this case, we only print the active component, the sensors. So you see these hairpin-like features. Those are the uh, resistive sensors. As we pull on that, we're, we're, we're the path length over which the electrons travel increases, the resistance increases. So we can dial in exactly and know what amount of strain has been applied to this by, by measuring the electrical resistivity and its change. So, okay, so what's going on here? We have a reservoir, we have our ink. This is actually the, the black material here, which is a conductive carbon material. And then there's this thing called the filler fluid, which tops off the entire process. Because think about this, it's just like taking a knife and cutting through jello. What happens when you do that? Behind, behind this nozzle, we're opening up a big crevice, okay? And so if we want to have something that has no defects, we have to fill in that crevice. So this is a filler fluid that comes in, same composition as the reservoir, but lower viscosity. So as we traverse through the reservoir, we're filling in behind it and burying this ink and coating it with the filler fluid. So this is what the rheology looks like. So we have our shear thinning response and our viscoelastic response, except for the filler fluid, which is nominally similar in composition as the reservoir, but very much lower in viscosity, which allows it to easily fill in the channels that we're making as we print. And then at the end of the day, so you can now see this process in real time. So we're printing one of these strain sensors. This nozzle is actually embedded into the matrix. It'll come out in just a minute. It'll pop out, okay, now it'll come back in and you can really see it going down into the reservoir and continuing to print. Now, this is, I mean, a very easy process. After we've done that, we take the whole elastomeric material with the embedded sensors and we thermally cure it so that it becomes a, a, a essentially a more rigid elastomeric material. And then we can do this in, in, in a little bit of clever ways. Um, this is just the electrical performance, which shows that depending on the printing pro speed, we can change the feature size. Um, if we have the same volumetric flow rate, the faster we move the nozzle, the um, smaller the feature that we're actually printing. And we can see that as we increase the length, we change the resistance. So as we stretch these things, as I said. And 
we can put one of these little hairpin sensors on each one of the knuckle positions of, of this glove, and then when somebody is moving their hand, for example, we can actually measure that. And so this is kind of an interesting process, for example, for people that have had surgery and might want to do rehab. And right now, when, when nurses actually have uh, patients that have had hand surgery, they have to sit there and measure actually measure um, using you know, simple tools um, what their mobility is. And now this is a way to have an electronic readout of that in real time. And it's a very low cost process. And you can customize this to the shape of the person's hand, either by using a mold or by fully 3D printing the object. And I just showed you um, more of a mold and fill process. Now we're also pretty interested in sensors that can be wearable, that can be textile mounted. And the way that um, we're doing that is shown here, where we're using um, a print head that has multiple inks that are delivering material to a single filament. So up until now, the filaments that were coming out of the printer were all single composition. They were either a silver ink or a carbon-based ink for the resistors or the battery electrodes. But now in a single filament as we're printing, we have multiple inlets. So you can see this here. There's multiple inks coming into the nozzle. And then coming out of the nozzle within there, we have a single filament that has this multi-core shell architecture. So if we look at a cutaway then of one of these filaments here or here, you see that the, the inner core, the innermost core, is a ionic conductor. It's wrapped by um, a dielectric material. It's then wrapped again by another conductive feature. And then finally, it's encased in the silicone elastomer. So this kind of architecture is a bit more complex than that simple hair, hairpin sensor. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to go away from resistive sensing to capacitive sensing. So now we're, we're measuring the distance across these two electrodes as we stretch the sensor this distance is now decreasing. And when it decreases, we get a change in capacitance. Okay, And so that actually is a more robust sensing platform because there's no hysteresis. It's, not, it's a hysteresis-free process. One of the bad things with the glove that I showed you in just a moment ago is that the baseline resistance is changing over time. And that makes it harder to do the signal processing to back out the actual strain and mobility. So now we have a situation that's independent of and does not have hysteresis response. And once we've taken these fibers and we've printed them, we do have a, an extra step or two. And one is to add these end caps. And you can see these end caps here. And these end caps also have these little tiny holes in them uh, that we can thread both to make connections to the elect electrical connections to them, and also that we can sew them onto textile so that we can textile mount these sensors. So on the next slide, what we see is this process now. Again, it's a hybrid process where we've taken these printed fibers, these capacitive fibers. We micro mold around there a more rigid um, outer material here. And then we um, bring our, our conductors in. And then we um, can sew these down onto, onto a fabric. And so we can make these of varying lengths, as shown here. And the important thing is that we can take these, these sensors and we can stretch them an enormous amount, right? So up to about 700% strain, so seven times their initial length before they actually break, right? So, so if you put them on a person and a person's moving around, they, they can withstand quite a bit of change in length without any kind of failure, right? OK. So, if we look at this then, in, in just a second, you'll see a movie. This sensor is sitting here across this person's knee. And when they move, you'll start to see a change in the signal. They bend, you, you get a response. And here's a, a colored version, just so you can see where it's actually placed. It's, it's uh, sewn in here and here. We could also uh, weave it into, say, a cloth here that, in the, that this person is wearing this glove, right? So um, this is actually some, some work uh, that we did in collaboration with Connor Walsh's group at Harvard. And Connor is developing um, both exoskeleton suits, which are, are good for, say, military applications where, where you have uh, extra support. And he's also doing a lot of work to understand 
balance with, with patients. So being able to know how their gait is changing um, uh, over time, for example, if, again, if they have had some type of medical uh, situation. So that, I think, was a fair, fairly fast whirlwind tour of, <laughs> of our work in, in electronics, right? So um, I, I really covered examples on, on, um, on antennas, uh, batteries, and, and, sensor, and sensors. Um, what I'd like to, to kind of end with is some of the new work that we're doing where we're, where we're moving away from synthetic materials and really going towards all biological printing. So trying to print um, tissues. And if we think about our bodies, our bodies are composed of cells and typically many types of cells, which I'll describe in some detail extracellular matrix, which is essentially a scaffolding where these cells reside and are supported. And then all of these cells require nutrients, and which is why we have this pervasive vascular system. So when we went to Harvard, we went from sort of hard materials or, or sensor-like materials, which are all synthetic, that are made by chemistry, to now starting to handle things that are more biological in nature. Um, and some of the motivations for our work, things that kind of keep us going and, and uh, get us up in the morning and, and into the lab and, and, doing, and doing the work that we do, is the recognition that, I mean, first of all, there really are major societal needs that, that necessitate the, the, um, the need for human tissues. And one, one that we think is uh, on the immediate horizon um, is, is to help uh, pharmaceutical companies develop new drugs more quickly. So right now, how does, how, does a, how does a pharmaceutical company bring a drug to market? First of all, they do cultures on, on a 2D culture with cells, and they introduce the drugs to the cells, and they look for drugs that, that play well with the cells. And if that looks good, then they move down the pipeline to animal models, and animal models are very expensive, and they don't always are, are not always predictive because humans don't have the same exact biology as animals. And then if they go through those two screens very well, then they move into clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, and the expense is enormous. Right now, um, on average, for every drug that is brought to market, there's about $1.25 billion spent. Now, not just on that drug, but on other drugs that failed in the process. Um, so the idea is, could we get a phase zero trial that's a fail fast trial where you have a 3D tissue that's made of human cells that you can do screens on that are ex vivo, that are not in the body, that are not in humans, that are more predictive, that are more predictive of their efficiency, efficacy and, and, and can right away flush out things that are, that are toxic. So that's one driver. The longer term driver for my group is in the area of tissue repair and regeneration. Um, and that is a harder challenge. And um, there, there's certainly a, a growing gap between people on the organ donor wait list. So this is about 120,000 Americans today are on the wait list waiting for door, uh, organs. Predominantly, the need is kidneys. About 80% or 100,000 people are waiting for kidneys. Um, you can see that this is the donor, uh, number of donors here, and this is the actual number of organs donated. Um, and so um, most people, when they die, have two kidneys, but it's not all that, uh, which is why there's a doubling here. If you look at the data and you kind of wonder why. Um, but but that's, that's kind of the thing that's driving us for the long term. Can we provide three-dimensional tissues that might have some use in the clinic for tissue repair or regeneration. But we're really starting at a very simple level with the recognition that human tissues are highly complex. Um, you know, there's multiple tissue types. They contain hundreds of different cells on, on average. These are organized in very complicated architectures. And they're moduli. So when we go from something that's a soft tissue to something like bone, span orders of magnitude. So the stiffness, soft versus your bones being very rigid, right? So in order to fully recapitulate all of this, um, you know, this is not a, a simple task. This is really a daunting challenge. And one of the things that's really held back the field of tissue engineering for many decades is the idea that up until very recently, until work in our lab and, and, and one other uh, lab that I'm aware of, um, Christopher Chen's lab at, uh, formerly at UPenn and now at BU, it was very difficult to create va and vascularize tissues. And so 
The challenge is that we have to be able to put in this pervasive vasculature because if, if you're building a tissue out of plane and you're going to create a tissue that's thicker than a few hundred microns, it needs this vascular supply in order to provide nutrients for the cells so that they live and also to remove waste products um, from them. So this has been a major bottleneck. And our approach was pretty simple. We said, all right, we're going to try to print. We have this filamentary approach. We're already printing little cylinders, right? I showed you a bunch of motifs that way. We'll wonder if one of these cylinders that we print, we can actually erase as after we've printed. We can actually remove it from the tissue and leave behind an open channel. That open channel will be then like your blood vessels if we line that with endothelial cells like you find in your, in your body. So it was a pretty simple idea. Um, we had already figured out a way to print uh, this a fugitive ink in a hydrogel. This was acellular, but you can see a very complicated architecture. So all we really needed to do when we came to Harvard was learn about cells. And, uh, <laughs> and as my postdoc who actually had spent time culturing cells tried to inform me, they're not like colloids, your particles, your silver particles, they live and they die and they're hard and they're fussy. And I'm like, well, let's just pretend, you know? So, so we did. So we started with a good dose of naivete. And um, we, we said, all right, we'll just treat cells like every other ink that we've ever made. And we'll, we'll try to focus on, on, on the design principles. And then we'll also build in, in addition to the cells in the vasculature, the extracellular matrix. And there we had some good uh, insight from the literature. There's a lot of work that's already been done on hydrogels, which are, which are essentially polymers that have water in them, which is what we find in our body. And there's a, you know, a good supply of, of biological proteins that we could work with that we could form the ECM. So with our ideas behind this fugitive ink, which I'll describe a bit more, the ability to create cell-laden inks and this ECM, we were pretty much all set to start trying to print our tissues. So this is coming back to our multi-material printer. And this is a very simple tissue that I'll describe in a bit more detail about how we actually printed it. And I'll show you a couple of movies. But let me walk you through step by step. So I mean, I did say at the beginning, rheology, rheology, rheology. So of course, you're going to see a little bit more there. Um, but we had to create um, multiple ink inks as I described, we had to create this fugitive ink. And this is really the key advance for printing the vasculature. And it's pretty simple. Um, the idea was we were created a material that was at room temperature viscoelastic so that we could print those filamentary channels. But when we cooled the material down to about 4 degrees C, it would liquefy. Now that's kind of not intuitive. Normally when you heat things up, they go from a solid to a liquid, right? You think about ice. It, bring it up, it, it melts. This is an opposite phase change. And it's all driven by the fact that when we look at the materials that we're using, they have these hydrophobic and hydrophilic constituents. And hydrophobic constituents don't like water. Hydrophilic constituents do. At room temperature, the hydrophobic pieces cause, cause the whole material to sort of form this gel. And, and have this viscoelasticity. But when we cool it down, it turns out that water can solubilize the hydrophobic parts. And it all becomes happy. And the chains resolubilize in water. And they form a very low viscosity liquid. And then this gelatin, um, which is um, a, a denatured collagen, the collagen protein you find in your body, um, we methacrylated that to allow us to create a tissue that when we did cool it down, we could pull out um, the material um, and without having any type of change in the, in the extracellular matrix. So just to convince you that this fugitive ink really does what I said, here it is as a gel at room temperature. It's solid. You tip the, you tip the container. It doesn't flow. At low temperatures, you, you move it. It flows very easily, almost like water. It's a little bit more vis viscous than water, of course, but it's just like that. So we can take that and we can print that into a, a variety of motifs. Um, here are some channels that this is, again, the schematics, if you will, um, or the CAD files, if you will. And these are the actual printed just fugitive inks, no cells, no ECM at this point. Um, and then this is the channels that we can then infill with a flu fluorescently labeled dye. You can see that we can, once we open these channels, once we rem remove the ink, we can then pervade through a fluid um, just like you can do with your blood vessels. 
Now the second part of that was after we created these channels, we had to line them with cells. So your body, your, your blood vessels in your body have endothelial cells. So we introduced um, human umbilical vein endothelial cells, HUVEX cells, into the channels. And you can see that they basically stick to the side walls. This is the lumen showing the capillary, the cross section of the channel that we've built. Um, and here are these fluorescently labeled cells so that you can see them very nicely within this channel, right? So we're, we're, we're making blood vessels essentially, or at least we're creating endothelialized channels. Now, in addition, we have to be able to co-print other types of cells because most tissues have multiple cell types. And one of the, one of the types of cells that we started with were, were these fibroblast cells, which are formed, found in your connective tissue. And you can see that here are our little traces of printed features. And this is under a fluorescence microscope. Again, you can see the cells. These are um, fibroblasts, as I said. And this is what you can see if we look at the number of cells that are living. Um, after day zero, so as printed, and then after a week. So I've got two sets of data here, the cells that are living as printed, the control, which hasn't gone through a very fine nozzle, hasn't had the same shear stress. You can see that there is some degradation of the cells during the printing process, but after seven days, there's essentially no difference between those that have been printed and those that are just been cast very gently in a low shear way. And so the, the, the cells are proliferating and growing in the tissue, and they're becoming, you know, they're happy. So the extracellular matrix that we've provided to them, the nutrients that they're receiving, they're keeping the cells uh, happy. Now, we've since recently moved to a new matrix entirely, which is slightly less stiff. And we can now print with about 95% viability as printed. So we've gotten better. The, a matrix is a very important constituent. So this is just an example of us printing simultaneously two types of materials, our cell-laden inks in green, the fugitive ink, which eventually goes away, and then we repopulate with these red uh, HUVEX cells, so these are uh, fluorescently labeled HUVEX. And then again, you can see the open lumen, and this entire architecture is encapsulated in an extracellular matrix. And I'll show you very nicely now on the next uh, slide how we make these in, 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 in real time. So the first thing you see is we're printing a silicone border. So this is an elastomeric architecture. This is not the tissue. It just kind of keeps the tissue where we want it. This first trace is one of the vascular uh, fugitive inks. So this trace will eventually go away and we'll populate it with the endothelial cells. Above and below, we've printed two different types of fibroblast cells, one with fluorescent green, the other with fluorescent blue. Now we've printed another fugitive ink that goes across that. And we just keep building up this tissue layer by layer. Now, this was our very earliest work, and it's, to be honest, not that impressive. Um, we are now, <laughs> well, when you look at it, I mean, OK, it looks like a little blob of ink, right? All right. <laughs> but you know, it's foundational in the following way. So after we've done that, we fill this entire thing in. We come in, we cool it down. We open up these channels. So now you're going to see this in real time. We're pulling this vacuum, and these channels are all going to open up, right? Great. OK, so we've created them, right? Now we're going to see them with cells. But now, although I won't show this in detail, I mean, we're now printing tissues that are like a centimeter thick by, by sort of, you know, um, of the order of an inch by an inch, right? So we're creating much more, you know, volumetrically significant tissues. But for a first go, we were actually very pleased. And, um, and the reason why this was important, because I think people saw the power of, OK, if you can print multiple cell types, you can encapsulate, you can embed, you can create these channels, um, you know, this is, this is a first step, right? And if you can do that, now all you have to do is think about how do you scale that? And so that's really what we're doing now. So this is this tissue with the red and, and uh, fluorescent uh, blue and, and green labeled cells and the pervasive vasculature. But you can ask yourself, wow, that vasculature doesn't really look that good, right? There's like open spaces where there's no cells. So again, first shot on goal. Um, so we, <laughs> that's what it was, right? First shot on goal. So all right, we got to do better. So we had to optimize the matrix. And now we're creating these beautiful vessels with, you know, confluent channels. Um, everything is beautifully lined. Um, these things can now be per perfused. 
Um, if I move away from, from this slide, really, we've created a matrix that's better. The cells are happier on this matrix in two dimensions. Um, they're, they're happy in three dimensions, which is the way they're going to be when we print this three-dimensional tissue. Um, and as I said, we can create these beautiful vessels now where we have um, this is a stain called VE cadherin. It only shows up when you have very tight junctions. So in order to have a confluently lined channel, you want to see this stain, right? So in our, our original vessels, you wouldn't have seen this because we really didn't have a complete coating of, of the endothelial cells in the channels. So we are now there. Um, moreover, we can start to see the onset of, 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 of a behavior known as angiogenesis. We are not going to, you know, if you think about the body and all of the capillary bed that exists between major vessels, we're probably not going to print all of this, right? So, but we can actually print some basic architecture and allow biology to take over and do the rest. We can feed growth factors through these channels. We can promote the formation of capillaries, which is like tip sprouting away from one channel connecting to the other, which is a very important process if we want to create a true three-dimensional tissue. So we can do that. And we can also perfuse these tissues. So we can take them, we can put them on a chip, and we can actually um, bring drugs into them to, to test drugs themselves. We can bring growth factors in to drive differentiation or drive processes like capillary bed formation. And so this is some of the ways in which tissues are normally perfused. Our original work, we just had them on a rocker. So we just had our little chip, and we kind of rocked and sloshed fluid back and forth through the channels, which isn't too controlled. And now we are making tissue chips where we can print these tissues and then uh, hook them up and then perfuse in, in a controlled fashion, multiple types of materials. So we're doing that in real time now. Um, an important part of this is as we endothelialize these channels, we want to make sure they have what is called good barrier function. And we also want to make sure that they mature and form these um, VE cadherin tight junctions, as shown here. And importantly, within each of these chips, for example, this is one that has two vascular ve blood vessels side by side with connective tissue in between. And here are the two lumens. You can see that we can control. We can feed them with media. There's a pump. We have a number of these chips all together. And importantly, this has been perfused for over a month. right? So we can have this long-term stable platform to study evolution and development of these, of these, of these tissues. So cells migrate. As I said, they want to be near these vessels. So you can see the fibroblast cells. The concentration of them is very close. If we don't have angiogenesis and we don't populate the internal regions, we either have cell death or just cell migration to the channels in order to, so they have the nutrient supply. And, and this is just a cross-section view, a, a higher magnification view of one of these channels. And this is a confocal movie through. So you can start to see fluorescent um, fibroblasts, and you can see all the way through that channel, very nice lining of the channel with the blood vessels and cells that are pervading inside the extracellular matrix. So indeed, we have been able to create these. Um, and moreover, they do have good barrier function. So we can flow dye through them. If they're not lined, uh, the dye you know, starts to spread into the matrix very quickly. But if we've lined them appropriately, um, they contain the cells provide a barrier that suppresses the diffusion of dye into the matrix. You can think about this also suppressing the diffusion of a drug, for example. But we can do that so they have good barrier function. And you know, finally, just to kind of give you a sense of where we're going, I did want to show one of our larger tissue chips. Now, this is a, a sort of in the middle of it being built up. But this is a very pervasive, complicated vasculature, a centimeter thick tissue that we've driven. So we've actually printed um, stem cells here. And we've driven that by, by perfusing um, growth factors through down an osteogenic li uh, lineage. So we can now take these tissues and we can, we can really drive them towards specific type tissue types. And you can imagine we can also then use these for things like drug screening. 
The in vivo applications, which I think are very, very exciting, are a bit farther away for, 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 for what we're doing, but it's certainly something that, that motivates us. So I guess at the end, I have to ask you, you know, after, you've, after you've seen this and what you know, like if you could print anything, what would you make? All right, so thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. I want to end with just thanking the, the people they do the work. <laughs> they are the, the people that are really the engines of innovation in, in all of the work that I've showed. And so thank you very much for your time. Um. The first part of your talk, right. uh, consider electrical and some mechanical sorts of printing, and the second part, biological. Right. If you could combine the two of them, what would you do? So, um, so the, it's a great question, and, and the idea is, can you do like instrumented tissues? So uh, our first attempt there is to actually take some of the things that I've shown you with strain sensors and create a, a tissue chip where we're putting cardiomyocytes onto these sensors and we're measuring them through electrical readout, their beating function. But one can get much more sophisticated than that by putting in electrodes and driving and stimulating. And so, I mean, I think the convergence of these two fields is, is very exciting. It's certainly things that we have on our mind. We've started with a very simple step forward, but but there's so much more to do. So yes, absolutely, we see that as well. Yeah. Yes. Can you tell us why you use the exercise matrix? Oh yes. So so gelatin was the first one that I talked about, um, and the the new matrix that we're working with is a combination of gelatin, but no longer methacrylated. So we no longer have to use UV light and fibrin. So it's an interpenetrating network of these. You're not using or anything like that? No, not yet. I mean, there's, we've screened a lot of different matrices. And it comes down to um, a combination of printability and, and, and the idea that the cells also are happy. So some of the matrices that you might really want to print, like collagen, are very difficult to print. And we've got some new things going on in the lab to overcome those hurdles. Uh, but uh, at this mo moment, what I showed you didn't include either fibronectin or collagen. Yeah. You're using two different types of cells, but you need a third one, <coughs> muscle cell. Yeah, I know. So uh, that I kind of glossed over just because of time. But um, you rightly point out that blood vessels typically have not only the endothelial cells, but they're wrapped with smooth muscle cells and then the connective tissues. So we are, in fact, doing those kinds of experiments now. We've done one step towards that with um, co-culture. But uh, where we co-cultured and we introduced into the channels both the fibroblasts and the endothelial cells. And we saw beautiful migration of the fibroblasts away as the endothelial cells uh, lined the channels. We weren't a as successful. We weren't successful when we did the co-culture with smooth muscle cells. But we've got some ideas now. In fact, we had a very interesting conversation at breakfast with, with colleagues um, at, the, at the Dartmouth Medical School. And just in, in that conversation stimulated some, some good ideas there. So we're going to go back. In fact, I already sent the email to the people in the lab. I'm like, you've got to try this. <laughs> because it's very important to have those smooth muscle cells. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Are there ways that the uh, synthetic uh, tissues could help us to understand cancer biology? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think there are. We haven't started this, but you know, the lymph system is very important and centrally important in you know migration of cancer through the body. As you think about uh, metastasis, and so we we are. <sighs> The beauty of what we can do, I think, is that we can create these tubular architectures. And so it doesn't have to be a blood vessel. It could be a lymph system. It could be, it could be you know, another type of tubular architecture. There, there are many examples I could give you. So um, we'd certainly be you know, interested in collaborating in that area. But so far, we haven't started any work there. Uh, 
Um, it seems the majority of your work is using the extrusion-based uh, yeah. printing technologies, yes. either electronics or bio uh, uh, area. I wonder, have you thought about using the photo curing based steel lithography and what would be the challenges yeah. doing that it's, using uh, yeah, no, it's a nanostructure? Good, it's a good question. So um, I think that uh, from the perspective of stereo lithography, one of the reasons why we have not used that is because it's very difficult to, to do multi true multi-material printing in stereolithography. So you have a, a, bat of, a vat of resin, right, and you're locally polymerizing with a light source, typically a UV light source. Uh, being able to do true multi-materials there, it's difficult to see how that could work. And we have just really focused on bringing new materials into the printing platforms and truly trying to create um, multi-material architectures. So that's why we've moved away from it. Um, certainly, stereolithography is great if you want to do complex polymer, just polymer materials, polymer structures. So I have nothing against stereolithography, but for our purposes, it wasn't sufficient. Yeah. Yes. I was curious. You're, you're, you're um, creating a a complex array of, of networks and tubules, and you're populating it with cells yeah. and the appropriate nutrients. How do you maintain all that sterile? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. There are many, many steps that go into to the inks preparation to first create sterile to sterilize the inks themselves, and 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 all of the the print heads and the printing platform, and then we move them into an incubator where we do have a sterile environment. So there are a number of steps up front that have to be done carefully, or yeah, it doesn't work. That's right. Yeah. You're using a living tissue as your model. Yeah. Have you seen anything in terms of materials or structure that improves on living tissue and living uh, and living yeah. tissue. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Somebody, a, a, another person asked a similar question, like, why do we have to just emulate humans? Why can't we do better? <laughs> I mean, I mean, one could argue that evolution is pretty good, but 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 I mean, I I think at this point we we are we are striving towards creating very simple constructs for drug screening, and in that case. They really do want to try to emulate sort of minimal functional units of human tissue. And so that has been a driver for us. But yeah, one can certainly think out of the box and think more creatively. But so far, we haven't tackled that. That's a good question. Yep. Hi. So do you think it is possible to bring this technique further down, like to a nanoscale material production? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I kind of glossed over that, but if you, uh, so we're applying pressure to inks that are flowing through channels, like our, our nozzles, right? So the pressure that you have to apply goes as one over R to the fourth. So as you ink decrease R, pressure goes way up, right? So um, moreover, what you're flowing through, you, you don't want to clog, right? So we have typically find as a rule of thumb, and we've done some very nice confocal model experiments, which I haven't shown, that it's about a factor of 10 to 100 times. Like the nozzle size has to be at least 10 to 100 times larger than the minimum size of the units that you're printing. So cells are 10 microns. Minimum feature size is at least 100 microns. We typically print using like 200 or so. Nanomaterials, like I showed some of the nanoparticles, can go through micron-sized nozzles. If we go down to, say, truly 100 nanometer nozzles, you know, now you need units that are a nanometer or 10 nanometers at most, right? And they have to probably be much lower viscosity so that you can actually apply reasonable pressures. Those are the constraints. Now, that's with our printing platform. There is a printing platform available in the marketplace called the NanoScribe, and it uses a variant of stereolithography. It uses two-photon polymerization, where they come in and with a local light source and illuminate a point. And that is probably the finest types of architectures that you can make, and those feature sizes are about 200 to 300 nanometers. They're not truly nanoscale, which is to, you know, cut off scientifically 100 nanometers or left, but they're very beautiful. They're very beautiful architectures. Yeah. So it's a good question. Anyone else? No? Okay, I get to ask one. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, well, we've talked before, but, I, but sort of a, Jennifer and I were talking about, I'm kind of curious. Can you the microphone? Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, Jennifer and I have been talking earlier about, um, you know, the sort of human robot divide, right? Which yeah. I think is a question that comes up with bioengineering of these, of this form. You know, everything you can make, you then say, well, that's not human because I can right. make it. Right. Right? right. So you keep whittling down or are beginning to articulate in a fine way sort of what's potentially yeah. human, I think. But I won't ask you that question, but I do think people should it's think It's provocative, about it. um, yeah. But, but I am curious if, if, if you do get like emails and mail from yeah. people, you know, I mean, yeah. after the New Yorker article, and yeah. say, what are you doing? You know, you're playing God in the lab, you're right. creating. So I'm just curious. No, know, that's, a, that that's a great question. I, I don't. I think my colleague George Church does quite a bit. <laughs> but he really is playing God because he's trying to bring back like Neanderthal. But that's a whole nother. <laughs> That's a whole nother thing. No, actually, I get the more heartbreaking email, to be honest, like because people read these articles in the popular media, and they're like, my daughter or my son, or when is this going to be available? And you know, we're such a long way away from doing something that actually can impact in the clinic, and it may never happen, right? So those are the emails that, that are difficult, right? Because you want to be able to help people, and, and they motivate you, but they also leave you sort of feeling terrible because you're like, wow, I can't help you right now. And maybe, you know, even in 10 years from now, I don't know if I can. But we're going to try, you know. And so those are the kind of emails that, that, we've, been, that we've been getting. Not, not a lot, but enough that, yeah, pulls on your heartstrings for sure. Yeah. All right. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you.